glad to see you all here. Welcome. Um, welcome to so many of you. It's a huge audience today. We're really grateful that you take the time out of your day to be here. Um, and I can see a few people still trickling in, so feel free to get settled um, whilst I run through the agenda for this morning. So we're really excited to be here talking about environmental sustainability and anchor actions. And um, hopefully the event and what we're going to share today applies quite closely to what you're doing in your organisation um, and the ambitions that you might have. Um, whilst I'm going through the agenda in just a second, please go ahead and put a little introduction in the chat. We would love to hear where you're from and um, what your specific anchor focus is and what you're looking forward to hearing about today. So to get started, a little bit of housekeeping. We are recording the session um, and that's so that anyone who wasn't able to make it today can hopefully watch the recording back on our YouTube. Um, we'll be distributing that afterwards so if you want to share that with any of your colleagues who couldn't make it today then please do so um, and we'll be sending that via email after the session. As usual on Zoom we have the chat open and um, we really do want to hear from you so as we go through the session please feel free to share your reflections and um, we'll be reading all of that. So we definitely want to hear from you. And we've also opened the Q&A. Um, so throughout the session, if you have a question, please pop it into the Q&A. Um, we're going to be holding about 15 minutes towards the end of the session uh, for you to ask those questions. Um, so we'll, we'll be putting those questions directly to the panelists um, and you'll be able to hear what they think on those topics. So please share all of your questions in the Q&A. So, what we're talking about today, we have a packed agenda and um, we have three fantastic speakers joining us um, from different places and they're going to be telling us about their environmental sustainability actions and um, the work they'd be doing in their organisations and also digging into the strategy behind that a little bit. So kicking off, we're going to have Dr. Katja Berendt, um, and she's joining us from NHS England and Improvement, which she joined last November as a senior net zero manager in the Greener NHS team. So what she does day to day is work on models of care and digital work streams, as well as air quality. And prior to that, her roles included um, integrated care and strategy, uh, specifically in acute trusts and also academic health sciences networks. And next up we have John Ebo, who is joining us as Acting Assistant Director um, for the Improving Population Health Programme at West Yorkshire and Harrogate Healthcare Partnership. Um, and what he does is he leads on the development of anchor institution principles, as well as the anchor vision, mission, and operationalizing the concept within the integrated care system. And I'm sure many of, of you on the call sympathize with what a difficult job that can be. Um, and some of his core focus is actually climate change ambitions. And that's what he's gonna be talking to us about today. And last but not least, we have Tanya Dahl Wunschmeyer, um, who is joining us from Guys and St. Thomas's NHS Foundation Trust, where she has been their air quality manager um, since last year. And her focus is around strategically developing and implementing a programme of air quality projects, which is to reduce the trust contribution to local air pollution, as well as lessen the exposure of pa to patients and staff. She's going to talk to us in a lot more detail about that in, the minute, in a minute. As I mentioned before, we will be holding a lot of time back at the end for you to ask those burning questions. Please do not be shy. So after we've gone through all of the content, the examples and the background which our fantastic speakers are sharing, there will be opportunity for us to discuss those questions. So hopefully most of you are joining us because you already know about the Health Anchors Learning Network um, but a tiny bit of background for those who are new to us. Um, so we are a UK wide network for people just like you who are interested in, responsible for um, or generally working on anchor approaches. Um, we run events like today where we're focusing on specific areas of anchor work um, and we also try to get people together to understand what they can adopt and adapt, adapt from elsewhere. If you're not signed up and you're not included in our network at the moment, we will share details of that at the end. Please do so. So why are we here today? Environmental sustainability and anchor actions is a hot topic. 
And in just 11 days, world leaders are going to be gathering in Glasgow to agree historic changes on how we tackle the climate crisis. It's not just a hot topic for us, it's a hot topic for everyone. So they're going to be working to secure collaborative plans and finances to reach global net zero by mid-century and keep 1.5 degrees within reach, as well as adapt to protect communities and natural habitats. So those are quite significant commitments and they do serve to underline the importance and urgency of environmental sustainability actions. So where does the NHS fit into this? Well, we know that NHS organisations have a significant impact on the environment. Data from England in the last five years estimates that the NHS alone is responsible for about 40% of public sector emissions. And we know that's the case because of us continuing to deliver high quality health and care and the demand that that places on natural resources and the environment. Given this impact, any action taken by the NHS to reduce environmental impact can make a vast difference. But what exactly does this mean for anchor institutions? Well, looking more specifically at the impact of the climate crisis, we know that there are serious direct and indirect consequences for health. And we know that with climate change and air pollution disproportionately affecting disadvantaged and vulnerable populations, there's a huge part for anchor organisations to play. These communities are more exposed to climate hazards, they're more vulnerable to the harms that they cause, and they also have relatively fewer resources to cope or recover from those effects. So what that does do is entrench those inequalities. Now, while improving environmental sustainability will have benefits beyond local populations, we know that um, it is also one of the main ways that the NHS has an influence as an anchor institution or NHS organisations do as anchor institutions. And it's one of the key ways in which we can improve wider determinants of health and continue to support community development. So that's all I have to say. Um, what you're really here to hear, hear about is those fantastic speakers and the work that they're doing. So without further ado, I'm going to pass over to Katya. Thank you. Um, I hope you can hear me okay. Yeah, thanks a lot for inviting me to this. Um, it's such, I think it's such an important topic, anchor institutions and sustainability. And I think there is a really big overlap between, uh, between both, uh, not just people that are interested. I see lots of sustainability leads in the chat, but also the two agendas. And it's a topic that's also personally really close to my heart as a clinician trained in public health. Um, so I, what I will do in the next 10 minutes is give a bit of an overview about our program and the next, uh, and sort of like our current priorities. So for some of you, uh, the sustainability leads, that might be a little bit of repetition, but just to make sure that, uh, um, yeah, everybody gets sort of like a basic idea of what we're trying to do. So let's launch into this. Next slide. Yes. So um, we originally, uh, the Greener NHS program is now a program of NHS England and NHS improvement. But um, we started off as the Sustainable Development Unit um, in 2008. Uh, and colleagues at the Sustainable Development Unit have been doing really quite a lot of groundbreaking work around sustainability and health and um, uh, carbon factors of pathways. And so last year, um, already part of NHS England, we, uh, we published this Delivering a Net Zero Health Service report. That's now a bit more than a year ago. And um, a few weeks ago, we celebrated one year on. So we were asked to report back to the um, Board of NHS England our progress in reducing carbons. And we had some progress to report and, um, and also our future plans. So um, I want to give a bit more background on uh, what we're doing. So if you move on, slide. Thank you. So why is this important? Um, I probably don't have to spell it out because all of us will be aware of it, but I think um, we, we know that climate change has an impact on health. And we think that if, um, or we know that 
if we can uh, reach our ambitions under the Paris Climate Agreement, it will really save lives um, through uh, some indirect uh, impacts like air quality, but also healthy behaviors that we would foster alongside with the interventions that we're looking, but that we're looking at. And um, I think this will become clear when I talk in a little bit about the sorts of things we're, we're trying to encourage. But I think it's really key that if this is not an, an optional additional agenda. I think this is key to being a health service. Thank you. Next slide. So what are we talking about? So when people talk about carbon footprint, they usually talk about scope one, two and three. So scope one means all the emissions that we directly cause. Scope two is our uh, energy consumption. And scope three is, um, yeah, it's more indirect. So stuff we buy, for example, um, for us, that's quite a big uh, concern. And we've uh, talked about them as carbon footprint uh, and carbon footprint plus. So the carbon footprint are the things that we can directly measure and act on. And the carbon footprint plus are the things that we can influence. And our ambition is to be net zero uh, in 2040 for for this carbon footprint that we can directly control and 2045 for our broader emissions that we can influence. And it's really important also to say that we've left, we also got some near term goals and we are um, in route to, uh, to achieve those goals around carbon reduction. So it's not something that we're putting off, we're taking action now. Next slide, please. So this slide gives you a little bit of an idea of the types of emissions we're looking at. And for those of you who have read the report, this will be a repetition, but um, so for the carbon footprint, uh, we, look at, uh, we look at waste and energy and uh, anesthetic gases and inhalers. We look at, uh, we do, uh, look at some travel emissions. Um, and then the wider uh, carbon footprint plus is a lot of uh, medicines and ca uh, chemicals, but also other equipment that we buy. And quite interesting, I'm, I'm guessing quite a lot of you will be uh, hosted in trust. So if you look uh, on the right side, the big blobs are with acute with acute trusts. Um, that is a lot where our carbon emissions are happening, and that's where our program has focused on a lot recently. But increasingly, we are also looking at primary care and community care, and um, yeah, what whole systems can do in this area. Next slide, please. So, in order to get to net zero, we really need to follow up on interventions in every aspect of what we're doing. So the um, some of our work streams look at direct interventions to do with uh, estates, to do with the fleet, um, to do with our supply chain. We have just published a roadmap on how we are working with our suppliers so that by the end of the decade, um, uh, hopefully they're all aligned with our um, net zero emission. Um, and then we've got the more indirect in interventions, which is where most of my work is around models of care and digital. So in models of care, it's really important that when we talk about sustainability, we do not just talk about LED lighting and green energy. They are important, but I think what's really crucial, particularly for clinicians, is how we provide care and that we do that in a, um, that we provide care for the long uh, term, that we uh, invest in prevention. Those are all fun how the fundamental service models, the way we provide care is really key to becoming a low carbon health system. And um, within that, there is also a role for digital, although we must be aware that digital also has its own carbon footprint. Um, and adaptation, I think for many of you will also be a key con consideration around the uh, um, resilience of, of um, estates to heat, but also flooding. And then we've got the, the cross-cutting themes. And if you look at the next slide, there are some particular interventions that we're looking at. 
So uh, the LED lighting I've mentioned, there is um, on uh, transport and travel, we are encouraging active travel, but also we are looking at a fleet transition uh, to, um, uh, to electric vehicles, which is in line with government policy. And um, in a bit more than a week's time at COP26, we will um, hopefully be there with the first uh, electric hydrog hydrogen hybrid ambulance vehicle. Um, when we build new estate, we're trying to align that with net zero. I've talked about the supply chain and in medicines, we're particularly interested in inhalers and anesthetic gases at the moment. Next slide, please. Um, but we can't do this without uh, all our staff. So um, we'll, we are about to launch a staff campaign um, where, uh, yeah, where we sh some, show some of the great work that's happening, but also encourage people to uh, make a pledge on uh, what they can do personally in order to, uh, yeah, to be more sustainable. And we're investing in innovation. We've just um, we had a big uh, SBRI innovation competition and are currently just. Um, uh, yeah, looking at the submissions. So next slide, please. Um, because of you as a particular audience, I did also want to really emphasize health co benefits. And I think air quality comes to mind there. Um, I'm based in London and here uh, we've, yeah, we've, I think air quality is on many people's, uh, is, is I think, quite uh, a big consideration. And um, while it's by a program, I think some of the interventions we're looking at, particularly with travel, will improve air quality. Um, and um, I'd be really, um, I'd be really keen to uh, hear from uh, those of you who are doing innovative projects or even monitoring um, of air quality. So please do uh, do get in touch. Thank you. Next slide, please. Um, I also briefly wanted to mention our new dashboard, um, which has loads of um, different information, not just on how many organizations are purchasing uh, greener energy and who has a green plan, but also um, other, um, uh, other, uh, other items like anesthetic gases and reuse of equipment. And the uh, link I've put in the last slide. Thank you. Next slide, please. So how can you get involved? So we've got a greener NHS community, which is um, yeah, which is aimed at interested individuals who uh, just want to be almost like champions in their organizations. You're not you're not signing up to any big project or anything, but it's a way of staying in the loop. Um, I've already mentioned the staff campaign. And um, so I think many of you are actually sustainability leads, but we've also asked all organizations to have a net zero lead. Um, uh, and I mean, a trust and ICSs with that. And you can feed into your organization's green plan. So I think that's it from me broadly. Yeah, I've uh, got a few links here. I'm sure we'll share the slides. Thank you. Thank you very much, Katya. That was a fantastic way to start off. So handing over next to John. Yeah, afternoon, um, everybody. And so good to be here to talk to you about what we're doing in our ICS um, on this agenda. Um, before I start, just a, um, a small thing. I've developed the code over the last couple of days. So I'm trying to be clear and be articulate. If you can't hear me, uh, my apologies. Um, but it's either don't come at all or, 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 you know, or miss this chance to talk to you. Fantastic people, like-minded souls, if you like, on this exciting journey of anchor institutions. So um, I'm acting head of, um, acting head of, um, or acting as a director, sorry, um, in, in um, West Yorkshire and Harrogate Partnership, and I'm leading on deriving um, our sort of narrative on anchor institutions and how we get our system to operate um, under those principles. So thank you for having me. Next slide, please. So, I mean, every every talk starts with a vision, right? So, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll do the same. This is our vision in our ICS. 
um, and it's very straightforward and it says exactly um, what, what is there. Um, we want to have better health and well-being for everyone in our places. Um, so simply put, over the next sort of five years or so, uh, we want to make sure that where we are with health, with our individuals, is exactly is, um, is improved, um, given where we started five years ago. So it's fairly straightforward. Um, and I think the important thing to note is within that vision, it's a huge opportunity uh, to bring anchor principles to bear on what we do. Next slide, please. So we have 10 key ambitions within our, within our plan of which um, climate change is one. And it's quite a bold ambition really. And, and we say in terms of climate change and sustainability that we aspire to become a global leader um, in responding to climate emergency. That's quite, that's quite a bold um, statement to make. Um, and, and quite rightly is because we, you know, we believe that the importance of this agenda cannot be under um, understated really and, and we're doing that through three key I suppose themes um, through mitigation where we want to reduce carbon um, through our buildings and supply chains and how we travel and how we use digital technologies um, investments around encouraging innovation and rethinking and developing climate friendly products and, and thirdly probably the most important piece is how we um, change culture and the way we see um, climate change and the way we see sustainability uh, within our system. For me, the, the true success would be for every employee, wherever they sit within, within our system, to always ask the question, and what about sustainability? And what about the impact on climate change? If we can do that, I think we've changed culture. All right, next slide, please. So I think, you know, in, in making the argument in terms of um, anchor institutions and the impact that we can we can have on our ICS. For me, when I look at the assets that we have and how we're set up as as places um, in our system, um, the opportunities are clearly huge, and the powerful impact of our system um, to build wicked issues um, is really quite a quite quite something. So the stats are there. I thought I'd put this up to show you the makeup of our ICS. Um, significant uh, budget, clearly in terms of. 5.6 billion uh, we employ within health and care the most um, workers in our in our places we're 72.7 million population and whichever stat you take there if you just imagine bringing those together um, whether you want to improve population health want to want to work on climate change and sustainability um, i think for me when i think about how we harness um, all these various opportunities uh, we haven't even scratched the surface I think about the economic buying power that we, that we, that we have as a system um, in terms of procurement. I think about the value we can add to local employment. I think about investing specifically in um, programs targeted at young people. Every single action comes back to doing this together as an anchor system. Next slide, please. So you know, how does you know, one empower institutions of scale within the system to be bold and, and, and collaborative um, on this agenda. And I think if we're really serious about improving, you know, uh, improving climate change and improving other social determinants of health, um, then our constitution principles are really non-negotiable. Uh, they're just basically the starting point through which we have to do things. So I'm clear that in getting you know, our system to really operate as an anchor system, um, I need to show colleagues the value in working this way. And what I've tried to do here is to set out a, a clear kind of value proposition as to why and how we do this. And I think what I'm seeking to deliver um, is set out in my lovely psychedelic colors um, that you can see on screen. Um, to build a momentum on, on, on a common anchor agenda across the system, I think that's a given. Um, to really articulate the vision and story for what we mean. Uh, by our system operating as an anchor institution. I think what we find, uh, I think others will probably bear this in mind as well, um, we tend to get uh, various definitions of what we mean by an anchor institution, depending on who you talk to. I want to find a way to come and get people to understand that in a very simple, clear way. I think that, that's necessary. And, and we do that by setting you know, a clear set of principles to guide a, a bold and smart ambition as to why we should work as anchors. And then a delivery plan that underpins and unifies all the actions we need to take through a, a charter system. Next slide, please. 
So I guess this is where I would probably end up in terms of deliverables. Um, as I said, a clear vision, create a charter, um, a very clear narrative on how we work as, a, as an anchor system. Um, we've already built a network of anchor institutions in our place, working with colleagues um, in, in the old PHE. I know that's changing. So we put together key um, like-minded people in this arena and we're already developing, um, working together in Yorkshire um, as an anchor place and, and sharing best practice and, and learning amongst ourselves. Um, there's some really good work going on in Leeds, particularly as a Leeds Anchor Network, and we're trying to see how we can harness all of that and share it amongst the other five places where we work um, uh, as, as a system. Clearly, this is all good stuff. Um, we must be able to evaluate and show the impact of how this is working. Otherwise, people will kind of um, say this is all nice and interesting. You know, the motherhood and apple pie it sounds very sweet but you know where is the impact on on people's lives and we must build that in as a dashboard on how we're having an, an anchor an anchor impact okay next slide please so i wanted to kind of share with you some example of a piece of work that's happened in one of our places in Cordodale um, around their work on flooding and the challenge of delivering um a, a, a sort of a zero carbon Cordodale um, by a certain time. Um, I think really, um, everybody has a, has a plan for, for zero carbon. Everyone's declared climate emergency. Well, how do you do that? Uh, for Cordodale, uh, they want to be carbon free by 2038. And they, they've developed detailed work around um, emissions reduction pathway on this. So taking you through what they've done would be, would be useful to kind of understand how we apply apply income principles to a particularly wicked issue um, around sustainability. Um, flooding is a really serious problem in the Calder Valley. Um, it has been for, for many, many years, since the 18, 1800s. Um, and the work they've done has gone beyond flooding actually. And this is where the power of anchors comes to play. In looking at flooding as an issue, what they've done is they've looked at not just reducing harm, but improving places, improving communities, improving people's lives, increasing activity levels, reducing air pollution, um, healthy eating, um, experimenting with cleaner, renewable tech. And this is all kind of on, on the, on the, based on the soft set of flooding as a major problem. So what's the problem? Um, next slide, please. So this is Summer Bridge. This is one of our towns in, in the Calder Valley. And uh, this was 2020. I could show you the same picture um, of this location five years earlier in 2015 and when we had the uh, Boxing Day floods and it looked exactly um, the same. Um, so the problem is that Cordodale's kind of flooding issues are quite significant. Um, we've had four major floods in the last eight years. Uh, more than a third of the homes and, and businesses that flooded in 2015 were in the Calder Valley. It is a significant wicked challenge. Um, some time ago, we were working on the, on the basis of one in a one in 100 year flood, as in a flood happening once in 100 years, where well, that's gone out the window. Um, the reality is we're getting more infrequent flooding. Next slide, please. So what this slide shows you is the, is the significance of the issue um, in sort of 10 year um, increments. Um, and actually in, in, in the latest period in, in sort of 2020, that last graph on the end there, uh, we've had 16 flooding events um, in, in the Cordo Valley. It is becoming more frequent and it's becoming worse in its impact. So it's something that we have to do with and, and, and tackle. So what have Cordo done? Well, what they've done is really operated on the anchor principles level to deal with um, not just um, the issues of responding to flooding as a problem. Um, operating a, a hub and spoke system where the local authority has been the hub, using its influence to draw in organizations across the piece to work on a whole range of projects to tackle not just flooding, but climate change issues. So here is Cargo Dale, uh, where they've helped to expand um, zero carbon delivery to three towns um, in the area. Um, they've had um, Cordodale Council putting in um, 5,000 or so, um, sorry, 500,000 
uh, money into a pot, much funded by another anchor institution, the local community foundation for Cordodale to create a one million pound pot specifically to address um, these issues. Next slide, please. So we're working to support sustainable projects across the peers, building renovation, um, outreach work, green and clean community transport work. And uh, ju just a point about community anchors. I think when we talk about anchors, issues, we tend to um, add a sideline or forget about community anchors and, and they, they're put into a different definition. They are important. Um, the definition of, of an anchor institution is, is, is you know, a significant organization of place that's, that's anchored to that place that is part of the solution for that place. So communities bring um, really good results to the anchor institution principles and should be considered as part of the solution. And working with our communities, we, we've, we've, we've done a whole range of work um, on this issue. We've enabled um, the first in the UK college uh, that's focusing on on um, green and and uh, sustainable um, sustainable pr um, projects around flooding, they are going to be delivering accreditation on how we manage flooding naturally in place, and that, that that's the first for the UK. Uh, next slide, please. So finally, what of the future? I think young people are far more. Um, verse in this area than we give them credit for the future is theirs um, the old coaches like me will you know will soon pass on and these young guys are making the right strategic decision as to what we do so let me introduce you to will will is one of our strongest local leaders on climate and will has created a, a climate accreditation scheme for schools um, and stars in a climate video which will be shared actually at cop 26 so will is clear that climate change and its impact in terms of flooding in Cold Valley is a number one significant issue that he dedicated himself to. Um, so lastly, let me just add by saying, you know, flooding has been the wicked catalyzing issue. And the standard response in the old days would have been to put in an emergency response, wait for the next floods, and then repeat. Actually, what Anchor Principles has allowed us to do uh, beyond the immediate issue is what I call sort of partnership working on steroids, right? A shared social value that has driven joint solutions, that has involved practically every business organization and community group that we could think about in Cordell. So let me just end there. There's been some really good outcomes. We've reduced um, carbon dioxide emissions by 40% in the Cordell Valley. And, and at the moment we've put in for a local um, authority um, award scheme um, nationally for this work. And I commend colleagues in Cordova who've delivered this. I haven't delivered this. I've just shared the message with you. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. That was fantastic. What a wonderful image to end on. Um, so now we'll be handing over to Tanya. Tanya, take it away. Thank you so much, Jan. Thank you very much for having me here today. It's really good to hear, even if again, to hear about the, the national um and and then the more regional kind of perspective i'll be talking more from a local trust anchor institution perspective and i'll give some kind of fairly detailed examples of some of the work that we're doing especially around air quality um so to those of you that are less familiar with us as a trust guys and st thomas's nhs foundation trust we are one of the larger trusts in the country comprising um, the acute sites of Guy's Hospital and St. Thomas's Hospital, as well as Walbompton and Harefield, but also 34 community sites across Lambeth and Southwark in London. So we have a, a fairly large operational footprint, if you want, which at the moment translates into a fairly large environmental footprint. Um, and of course, ideally going forward, we would like to decouple those two um, a bit. So I've provided, I'm providing quite a lot of detail on my slides. Uh, though, those are going to be shared. So if you would like to go through them in more detail later, then that information is available to you. I will only talk you through some of the main slides, uh, some of the main points on those. If you can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So our mission really as an, as an organization is to be at the forefront of delivering sustainable healthcare. So not looking at, not only looking at today's patients, but also looking at how we can proactively protect the environment that we as a trust really depend on to operate um, effectively. 
if we go to the next slide. Thank you. So to do that, we have for the first time published um, a sustainability strategy in June this year. This is a 10 year strategy, 2021 to 2031. Um, without going into an awful lot of detail here, but um, this is, uh, we have three overall themes in the strategy. So carbon zero, connecting with nature and then cycle of resources. And within those themes, we have three key areas. Now, importantly, we also have um, what we call our enablers. So those are our people, so our staff, so see how we can engage them into delivering the strategy and also our approach. So how do we actually implement this through clear leadership and governance? Um, and then also importantly, the areas that you don't see here as individual areas, but they're really cross cutting through through many of these. So air quality is one of them. Water is another, for example. And I will talk um, about this in a little more detail. The sustainability strategy is available on our website, Guys and Thomas's. If you go on our website and, and search for sustainability, this will come up for those who would like to have a closer look. If we go to the next slide. Thank you. So really our understanding um, of ourselves as a, as a trust, as an anchor institution in Southeast London um, underpins the overall strategy and, and how that translates into action such as um, purchasing more locally and working very closely with local partners, um, using our buildings and spaces, looking at our green and, and blue um, uh, places and how we can connect and protect and, and promote those and looking at our um, how we reduce our environmental impact and our, that's what I will be focusing on on today in more detail. If we could go to the next slide. Thank you. So, so why are we talking about air quality? I think Katya already um, provided us with a great kind of background to this. So I won't go into an awful lot of, of detail here, but the point really is from an anchor institution, I think we are operating in a highly polluted area of, of London. Um, so especially our um, Guys and Thomas's sites and our um, uh, local sites in Lambeth and Southwark. Both Lambeth and Southwark do not meet the uh, WHO air quality targets. Those were tightened recently. We didn't meet the old ones. We definitely don't meet the new ones. Um, at the same time, our own operations really um, contribute quite significantly to uh, local air pollution. Um, and we know that exposure to um, high levels of air pollution has a significant impact on, on human health and that in turn has an impact on our own operations. So for example, we know that we have a large number of children um, presenting with asthmatic conditions on days of high air pollution. We know that we have higher numbers of cardiac arrests on days of higher air pollution. So it has an impact on our operations as well. So it's not only from an anchor institution responsibility point of view that we need to address air pollution and I always see that if you want as a, a two coming from two angles so one is addressing our own contribution to to the problem and then also seeing how we can reduce exposure and keep our staff and patients safe so if we go to the next um, slide Thank you. So this is a range of air quality projects, um, just, just examples of those. Um, Katya talked about air quality monitoring earlier. We do a fair amount of that um, already and want to do more going forward. I will not be talking about this in any detail today, but again, happy to engage with anyone who would like to know more about that. So if we go to the next slide, I'll come to four examples and we don't have an awful lot of time to go into any detail, but again, happy to talk about that in more detail if you would like to. So if I talked earlier about our own contribution to local air pollution and how we reduce exposure. So the first two examples are really looking at our own contribution. And Katya talked earlier about innovative solutions. I'm not sure how innovative these really are, but I think they are important first actions to take. So for example, in our own sustainability strategy, we have a clear commitment to reducing our uh, emission, the emissions from our fleet to net zero by 2031. And as Katya mentioned, we have very clear sector mandates too. But to actually reach those targets and to, to report on progress, we first of all need to understand our own fleet and our emissions profile, which might sound very straightforward, but it isn't 
necessarily and it certainly wasn't for us. So there's funding by the Department for Transport to work with um, Energy Saving Trust who support organisations um, on understanding um, their own fleets. That funding is still available so to those organisations here today for those for who that's um, for whom that's relevant um, this is a very good starting point. So we did um, work on this. I could talk about this and the findings um, for a very long time, but perhaps just to highlight just a few points. One is we actually have significant um, opportunity to remode some of our fleet. So for example, to make this more specific, um, we have a fairly large number of vehicles that actually do very little mileage each day. So looking at, do we actually know, really need those vehicles in the first place? If we do need to them to transport something, could we use cargo bikes, for example, instead? Can we downsize the, um, the vehicles that we have, which would have a, a very positive environmental impact? So we're looking at that at the moment. Um, for the rest of the fleet that we still need, we now know that it's technically and operationally possible to fully electrify that fleet by 2030 and actually the vast majority even by 2025. So this is really helpful in terms of internal communication um, uh, to have this information if you want from, from an organization like Energy Saving Trust uh, to be able to tell us we are actually able to do that with the type of vehicles that are currently available on the market. Um, we also need to look in more detail at our own salary sacrifice scheme and what type of vehicle leasing we enable through that scheme, looking in more detail at our grey fleet um, and uh, also really need to, to work on what type of data we uh, get and how we consolidate that and centralise that to be able to report on emission reduction. And then it, it comes up as a bit of a side point here, but it really is essential if we want to, to electrify the, um, the, the fleet that we still need, we need to look at charging infrastructure. And for us as a trust, this will be highly site dependent, but for us as a trust, we have major challenges around that because we have very little spare power capacity. So that's something that we're looking at in, in a lot of detail at the moment. If we go to the next slide. So I talked previously briefly around remoding. So for example, how you shift from a car to a bike. Um, so as part of that, we are working with a particular neighborhood nursing team at one of our community sites at the moment, seeing with them whether we can actually move them from a pool car onto a bike. Um, and we are running a pilot there at the moment. We just launched that literally last week. So it's brand new and ongoing at the moment. Um, I think we also in a way come, this comes at a good time in London because of the expansion of our ultra low emission zone. Um, parking is becoming increasingly difficult and more expensive and so on and so forth. So there's a, a fairly large amount of nurses that are very open to the idea to uh, actually switch to a bike rather than a car. Uh, and in addition to the environmental benefits of this work, there are significant health and well-being benefits for the nurses themselves. Um, and for us as a trust, there would be significant roll-up potential of this pilot. So just, just for us, we have a approximately 400 neighborhood nurses across the trust so even if you if you move a percentage of those from a car onto a onto a bike that would have a, have a significant impact so like i said the pilot is ongoing i'm really happy to share kind of details and findings when we know more but there's a lot of enthusiasm at the moment which is great if we go to the next slide so like i said so the last two examples were around our own contribution and now we're looking at how some of the work that we're doing around trying to reduce exposure and raise awareness of uh, pollution. So at the moment, I think it's fair to say, prior to this work, it was fair to say that as a trust, we did not really communicate uh, around um, high and very high pollution um, events. So for example, when we know that there's a very high pollution day in London. It, it, this was not something that we were communicating to staff or patients. So we have put together an air quality alerts plan, which really functions a bit like a hot weather alerts plan or a, a cold weather alert plan, like you might have in place as a trust already. Um, and essentially what this does is that when we get an alert from DEFRA that we uh, know that a very high 
or high or very high pollution event is coming, uh, an email will go out, a clinical alert will go out in email form to all our 22,000 staff with information about recommended actions and health advice for staff themselves and for, um, for them to give this information to patients. We haven't seen this in action yet because we haven't luckily seen a high, very high air pollution event since, but hopefully it will all work smoothly when, when this happens. And if we go to the next slide. Thank you. So this is the last example, and this is again more about mitigation than anything else. So at Geis and St Thomas's, we have a Geis and St Thomas's day nursery where we have approximately, well, we have just over 100 children attending. Um, they're mostly uh, children of staff members, um, but also some from the local community. And this, um, they have a lovely playground, but the playground is really sitting in a very polluted triangle between Westminster Bridge Road and Lambeth Palace Road, one of the, probably one of the busiest roundabouts in London. Um, so as lovely as the um, playground is, it's very much exposed to local air pollution. So what we have done is put in place an IV pollution barrier um, that will keep some of the pollution out and the IV also functions as a as a trap if you want. For. In addition to the air quality benefits that we expect from this, there's also significant kind of health and well-being benefits for the children and staff just to be surrounded by green rather than seeing all the vehicles around them. Um, increased biodiversity, the, the, the green screen, you know, it's some, such a simple measure to put in and it's really popular with um, the children at the nursery but also the staff, they're seeing um, more bugs around and they're looking at them during their playtime. It's also improved privacy um, for the children at play and has some noise and carbon reduction potential too, although we absolutely acknowledge that that will be um, limited but it, but it will be there. So uh, that is all for me, really just to give a few examples of, of what we're doing. I'm obviously happy to talk about the more high level why and how as well, but I thought it might be useful to give a few specific examples. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Tanya. Uh, that was great to hear and I enjoyed those three speeches a huge amount. We also have some questions streaming in to the Q&A. Please don't be shy, everyone, if you have questions do share them and um, we've got just about 10 minutes for questions now which is great um, and we had a very interesting one um, which I think is relevant for all of the panelists so anyone um, any one of you can feel free to answer this but thinking about how greening links to health inequalities so um, the, the specific question here was around how are teams accounting for people who are maybe digitally excluded who are heat poor, um, those who are living on the streets, and then maybe also thinking about issues like food waste from hospitals, um, green space where we're growing food. So what is it that we're doing to account for people who are suffering from those health inequalities? Should I go first? Go for it, Katia. Um, yeah. So I think this, yeah, the question of health inequalities is absolutely crucial um, because, uh, I mean, we know that uh, globally climate change, uh, the impacts of climate change are in equally distributed and affect most uh, um, those, who, yeah, who uh, are already disadvantaged. And we do also know um, in this country, for example, we've talked about air quality. Again, uh, a bad air is unequally dis distributed. And there is this uh, triple effect that uh, um, people who are disadvantaged tend to uh, tend to um, live in places that have worse air but contribute less to actually the causes of bad air, um, uh, air quality and similar also with um, yeah with more direct impacts of, of climate change so I think that's one of the sort of like key assumptions in our in our program and then within that I think for every specific intervention we need to look at uh, how how that impacts on inequalities, and the questions will be uh, will be very diff will be different very different for each of them. So uh, clearly, for dig for digital, um, I think in some areas, uh, uh, virtual 
um, appointments and remote monitoring have actually, uh, for some demographics, in, improved inclusion, but also in uh, other areas it might have made it worse. And I think studies on uh, so, uh, there are studies and actual research on that is currently um, ongoing. Uh, but I think it's something we need to be aware of that uh, we can't fully rely on digital and digital also has a carbon cost. I think it needs to be a part of a much broader holistic agenda on how we provide care. Um, I think, yeah, food waste was mentioned. That's something that we're looking at in terms of uh, um, hospital trusts. Um, uh, working with uh, those who are um, fuel poor or on the street. I think that's where we also really need help from uh, or like work together with local councils and come together in health systems locally because I guess as uh, um, the Greener NHS, our our mandate is very much NHS services. So I think we are we we can do quite a lot, but uh, we are limited in some areas, and that's where collaboration is really really crucial. Perhaps, Jan, just to add um, to that from my side, if that's okay. So mm -hmm. I think, like Katya said, there are significant inequalities in how, how we are affected by poor um, air quality in London. And I should note that the um, Geist Thomas Foundation impact on urban health, who are part of the Geist Thomas Foundation, do fantastic work uh, on this as part of their health effects of air pollution um, work um, within a trust. So I think that's really something that we need to take into account again from an anchor um, kind of institution point of view. So just to give you one example of how I'm thinking about this, and you know whether it's the right approach or not. But for example, when we talk about our e-bikes for our neighborhood nurses. So when we think about how to roll this out, we should probably think about not only from our own operational point of view, where we would want to roll it out, but also take into account air pollution levels, but also deprivation levels and other um, uh, underlying health um, conditions, for example, across Lambeth and Southwark and our local communities. And on that basis, take all of that into account to then decide where to focus on to, um, in, initially, if that makes sense. Yeah, great insight. John, did you want to add? Yeah, just I think really on the point of health inequalities, I think it's really interesting that we, um, we are suddenly woken up all of a sudden to health inequalities it's, it's fascinating um health inequality has always been a, a real challenge for us and i know every every session i go to every seminar i attend somebody always opens with you know and on the back of the pandemic we've learned that and on the back of the pandemic we've seen that well actually yes and um, the pandemic has laid bare some of the challenges of health inequalities and that i think that's the point of unconstitutions is that that approach is really kind of you know all encompassing and it, it enables institutions in place that have the ability to make the most impact um, on people's lives get together and do so in a meaningful way. Of course, it's not easy. And, and culturally, you know, that's challenging because, you know, the, the reality of life is, you know, we're all chasing, chasing the same funds uh, and we're all working to, to, I suppose, health outcomes where uh, we're asking government to support what we do in our areas, in our, in our particular um, systems. But the point is, you no. Know, if we can be brave enough as leaders and collaborate um, on this issue, um, the impact of the outcome is, is far reaching and, and you can't get away from unconstitutional principles, whichever way you look at it. And so my, my straight answer is, uh, whether it's health inequalities, whether it's you know, sustainability, whether it's you know, um, other challenging issues, um, the unconstitutional principles as a way of working has got to be the starting point. It's not a project. It's not a gun chart. You know, it's the glue that holds you together. So that, that's pretty much the most important thing in my view. Fantastic. Um, we have a question which is related to what you've just been talking about, John. Um, and the question is specifically, how easy has it been to get support at board level for this work? Where has that been done under the radar? Um, and the, the, I guess the points that have been um, discussed in the chat was focusing on changing the behaviour of senior, senior management and decision makers um, so that it impacts all processes and decisions. So Tanya and John, I wonder if you have thoughts on how this has worked in your organisations? 
Yeah, I mean, I can I can come in on that. I mean, for for our system, this is absolutely central. So I mentioned we have ten ambitions in our overall ICS strategy, and climate change has a you know has its own specific um, strategy kind of work around that. So it is as important as all the other, if not more, um, health and care plans that we have, and um, it is it is led by the team in improving population health so we hold that kind of um we, we hold the i suppose the, the 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 direction for that but you know it is brought into by by all our senior leaders we have we have two if you if you like senior responsible officers one one comes from health and one comes from um, the local authority and, and the public sector and together they hold the ICS accountable for the work it is doing on, on, um, on climate change. But it's not just about leadership at that level. I think there is something about this being everybody's, every, everyone has kind of everybody's issue and everybody's um, input. So we've held, you know, uh, lunch and learn sessions with staff to connect to this issue at a very personal level. Um, and whilst you know, leadership is important and it needs that drive around that strategic work, I think you know, we shouldn't underestimate the impact of, of what people can do as individuals um, within within their own within their own sort of homes and 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 workplace. So we we do both actually. So we have strong leadership on this issue, and and, and the code of the flooding example is one way in you know, where the local authority has been local authority has been the hub that has drawn in all these organisations of influence. You know, Yorkshire Water, you know, um, the Environment Agency. Um, various local local um, organizations to look at this issue as a whole as a whole issue so yes you know it does need leadership uh, for our ICS it's selling bought into as a leadership issue so it's not a it's not a side issue it is the issue yeah I think perhaps to add to add from our side and I should say that um it, the, the kind of the work on the sustainability strategy and getting board level support started before I joined the trust. So I can't take any credit for that. But I think absolutely there's board level support for this work. But I think it's probably important to differentiate between high level in principle support and then you know, the daily putting it into practice and implementation. So for example, when we talk about um, developing, I, I don't know, specific roles to actually implement this sort of strategy, you need to develop a business case. In a different business case, you need to show cost savings. Now for this type of, sometimes we can, sometimes we can't. If you can't, does that mean that it's that you shouldn't be doing this? Probably not. So I think there's a difference. We should differentiate between the high level support and principle and the actual support in implementing it um, going forward. Fantastic. Okay, so unfortunately we're getting to the end of our time. Just want to acknowledge that there are some fantastic questions that are being asked. Unfortunately, we won't be able to get to all of them, um, but we will be taking those questions away. and We most definitely will be looking at them outside of the se session. So thank you so much to our speakers. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, if you're not signed up as anyone in the audience, please do sign up so that you can hear more about what we're doing um, and you can hear some more of these questions hopefully being answered over the coming weeks when we put some more information out. Um, before you go, please do answer the poll um, so you can tell us exactly how fantastic you thought those speakers were and how useful this is to you. And lastly, we'd love to hear from you. So if you want to drop um, something into the chat before you head off for the rest of your day very briefly um, about an insight or an action that you're leaving with, um, we hope that you've enjoyed today very much. Um, we've enjoyed having you here. Thank you so much for all of your time. And once again, thank you to those fantastic speakers.